Hi, and welcome to this live reading from The Last Cabin Girl, Detective Josie Thompson, Book One, by Tom Swires. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter One. Seven months earlier, June 27th, 2019. Well, before the virus popped out up on her radar, Josie t kept a tidy, squeaky clean backwoods cabin. Even so, Trash Night served up a weekly reminder to her that there were some things she just couldn't part with or do away with, no matter how hard she tried. Her husband, Eddie, was one of those things. As she rolled out her family's trash bin to the curb that night in an upstate New York town named Indigo Valley, a fog bank crept in off the Mohawk River and obscured the fireflies at the edge of the woods outside of Josie's cabin. Crickets chirped in the weeds. A veiled crescent moon lurked above. Her 200-yard-long driveway was as dark as Old Moose Side. River Road had no streetlights. Her nearest neighbor was miles away along the dipping, winding back road. Isolated and alone, Josie held a small flashlight in one hand to show the way. Her two kids were upstairs in the cabin, milling around, doing anything to put off getting ready for bed. In, abs in Eddie's absence, Josie was a 44-year-old single parent who had her hands full. When she approached the end of the driveway, an arm flashed across Josie's face from behind. It jackknifed over her throat and squeezed her airway shut. She gurgled, and her eyes almost popped out of her head. The trash bin and flashlight fell to the pavement while she struggled to pry the arm away with her hands, but the chokehold held like a vice. "'Good evening, Josie,' he whispered as her arms flailed in desperation. "'We're gonna talk, just you and me, husband and wife.' Josie tried to elbow his ribcage, but he sidestepped out of reach. She blindly arched to grab his testicles like she'd learned in self-defense class, but he dodged her thrust like a matador in a bullring. That's not polite, Josie. I need you to relax. I'm going to let you go, then we're going to have a nice little chat. We need to catch up. I haven't seen you in weeks. I have a knife on me. I, if you act up, I'll use it. Now hold up two fingers if you understand me. There was no blood flow to Josie's brain. She felt dizzy. She surrendered, waving one finger in the air. The middle one. Eddie slapped her in the face with his free hand. Josie saw stars. I said two fingers, Josie. You know good things come in pairs. One symbolizes loneliness. You're not lonely, Josie. You have me. Josie was now afraid she'd pass out. She flung two fingers up. Eddie then threw her down on the driveway. Josie landed on all fours, teary-eyed and gasping, trying to catch her breath. When Eddie picked up her flashlight, she saw him draw a short blade machete from a sheath hanging off his belt. Eddie stood over her, just out of reach, poised between Josie and her kids in the cabin. Josie feared he was going to decapitate her. Eddie touched the cold blade to her face, and a chill ran down her spine. He flashed the light on the fluorescent numerals affixed to her roadside mailbox post in the distance. So, 4144 River Road is your address. Is this where you plan to stay now with my children? Josie panted on all fours and nodded. Eddie slowly pulled the blade away. Those are bad numbers, Josie. Very bad. Four means death. That's why the MGM, Wynn, and Palms Place casinos in Vegas don't have fourth floors. Bad luck. Now get up. You're going to walk with me back to the cabin. I want to see what this place looks like. Josie stumbled to her feet. Bent over with her hands on her knees, she looked up. She saw Eddie's ethnic Chinese features imprinted on a head shaped like Humpty Dumpty's, only inverted, the narrow half forming his chin. Inky, wavy hair looked like someone had dropped a bushel of black feathers on top of the egg. His six-foot-tall frame supported that large head. Even baggy black sweats couldn't conceal the muscular physique of a fitness fanatic. How Josie wished she had a gun then, but at that point, her Glock 19 was merely a dream buried in a stack of concealed carry license applications. The thought of decapitating Eddie was with his machete flashed in her mind. I see you still get a rush out of throwing me around, she croaked. Eddie's perfect teeth flashed in the gloom, a $15,000 smile. While Josie was waiting at the dental office manager at the diner one morning, the woman told her that pet Eddie paid for his smile with Oxycontin. The dentist was now at a California private pay rehab facility, though the official story said he had to take a temporary leave for family reasons. You've always been a tiger, Josie, and sometimes a tiger needs to be tamed. 
Josie's petite frame now stood upright. She pushed her shoulder-length blonde hair back away from her face. Clearing her throat, she found her full voice. Is that the reason for my scar? Hopefully, two scars. We wouldn't want the one scar to be lonely. Besides, scars look sexy on a woman. Shut up, Eddie. If you think you're going to kill me with that thing, I'll at least leave you some scars to remember me by. Eddie laughed hard like he did when he won a hand at blackjack. If I don't kill you now, you're as good as dead anyway. When you live in a house with this address number, you'll die soon enough on your own. I see your arithmophobia is still serving you well. I don't fear numbers. I respect them and their place in the grand scheme of life. Like the Beijing Summer Olympics opened at 8.08.08 p.m. on the 8th day of the 8th month of 2008. Because 8 is a lucky number. Respecting numbers has served me well, especially at the casinos. You're superstitious, Eddie. Believe what you want, I don't care. Eddie grabbed herself from her back jeans pocket and slipped it into his black sweatshirt pouch. He made no move to walk down the darkened drive without her. Generations of city dwellers and his family back in China had ingrained a distaste for solitude in the great outdoors. First, go put your garbage can at the end of your driveway like I've seen you do every Thursday night. No funny business. Eddie waved his machete toward the road. Just Josie dragged the bin to the end of the driveway, with Eddie lurking off at her side. He stayed where he could keep her in reach, but no one in a passing car would spot him. Now let's walk back to your cabin. You go first. You're garbage, Eddie. Shut up and get moving. Josie started walking with Eddie a few steps behind. She thought about running away, but the bush, the brush on either side of the driveway was thick and she was wearing Crocs. After fifty yards, Eddie asked, Are you the only house on this road? His unease was palpable, like the vibes from a junkyard dog. It's not a road, it's a driveway. You should know it's the only home on it. I'm sure you've scoped the place out. The satellite view in Google Maps didn't reveal what was beneath the leaf canopy covering the property. You didn't go to Town Hall and look at the property maps? What, and have to sign in and be recorded by security cams? I don't think so. By the way, I don't see any security cams on your property. You never know, Eddie. You're bluffing. You were never any good at poker. Are you sure, Eddie? Game cameras come with camouflage covers and infrared sensors. Josie was bluffing. Anything to keep Eddie off the balance. She knew he'd never set foot in Cabela's, so he knew nothing about trail cams. Does your driveway end at the front of the cabin or off to the side? Josie sighed. In front. <sighs> Not good. This is like having a house on a dead-end street, then. Air can't flow freely at a cul-de-sac. Dead air accumulates there. Whatever, Eddie. The airflow is just fine by me. Eddie shined the flashlight up the driveway and into the woods. He could just about glimpse the porch lights 100 yards away through the trees and underbrush. I don't like this long, twisting driveway. Is that big brain of yours getting dizzy? Eddie constantly said he needed a big forehead to hold his big brain. It drove Josie crazy. Are you getting dizzy, Eddie? Does it feel like you're going to get sick on the roller coaster again? Old Taunt still had the power to jab. Knock it off. Twists away from the cabin hints at a lost fortune. Not good. I don't like to lose money. That's not news. Why are you here, Eddie? I told you. I want a personal tour of the cabin and the grounds. Once you've seen the place, you'll leave? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not showing you the cards in my hand. Does the front of the cabin face the river? Silence. Eddie clenched his teeth and growled. Answer me. Yes. Not good. It means the cabin faces north. That's bad luck. His voice was starting to crack. I, I see on Google Maps that the river bends away from the cabin. More bad luck. When the cabin came into view, they walked around to the front of the cabin facing the river. Eddie shined the light on the front door and the trees in the front yard. There's a tree in your front yard in front of the entrance door. What of it? Now Josie could see a sheen of sweat on Eddie's face in the lamplight that spilled from the living room. It blocks the flow of positive energy from through the front door. And that arched door, it's shaped like a tombstone. It means death. The cabin is bad feng shui, worst I've ever seen. Eddie wiped his forehead and fumbled to slip his machete back into its sheath. He handed Josie her cell and flashlight slick with sweat from his hand, then locked his glassy black eyes on her before backing away. I want no part of this place. You're going to die a horrid death in here, Josie. You really shouldn't keep the kids here. As Eddie turned to walk away, the front door suddenly opened. Jack, their 11-year-old son, popped out. Tracy, their teenage daughter, was not far behind. Dad! Jack said with a big smile. 
I thought I heard you out here. I told Tracy it was you, but she didn't believe me. Tracy stood there stone-faced, half of her body shielded behind the oak door, one hand grasping his edge. Eddie turned back to the cabin. Hi, Jack, he said with the wide smile of a proud father. Jack looked over at the end of the driveway, then back to his dad. Where's your Lamborghini park, Dad? Cars were a status symbol to Eddie. Growing up in urban China, his family never had one. Ah, uh, off the road, at the end of the driveway. Can he come in, Mom? Eddie quickly blurted, No, no, I can't. I'm, I'm sorry, Jack. I've got some business I need to finish tonight. Josie knew from harsh experience that night business meant drug business. But Jack didn't. How do you tell your young son that his dad is more of a drug dealer than a doctor? Josie hadn't figured that one out yet, so Jack lived in innocent ignorance. Hello, Tracy, Eddie said. Dad was all she could muster in reply. She knew her dad was involved with drugs. She'd heard it from the kids in high school. The jungle drums were well informed about the best sources for people who wanted to get high. When Tracy confronted Josie about it, she didn't deny it, but didn't want to discuss it. Soon, Tracy didn't want to talk about it either. Eddie asked her, Are you still going Fallon Gong? Tracy sighed. Yes, Dad. It's not good, Tracy. Dad, it's a spiritual practice with roots in Buddhism. I like it. Not good. Josie jumped in, desperate to head off a repeat of a running argument. Please, Eddie. Not now. Okay, okay. Well, good night, all. Eddie said. Goodbye, Dad, Jack said, waving. Josie, Josie and Tracy didn't say a word. With that, Eddie turned around one more time before jogging, then running into the darkness. In that instant, Josie realized she had her best defense against Eddie. He was absolutely terrified of everything about her cabin and her far-flung rural property. His superstitions had conjured up his kryptonite. Though shaken by their encounter, Josie felt a sense of relief. The cabin had morphed into her fortress. All she needed was a gun to defend herself and her kids from this dragon.